Thank you, thank you, Jim. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Wow, we got a lot of folks up in here, huh? Uh, it is truly uh, my honor and my privilege to come back to my home away from home. Uh, I cannot say how uh, great it is to come back to Seattle where I get to see a lot of familiar faces and it really takes me back to a lot of my intellectual grounding. Uh, I cannot say thank you enough to Jim Banks for the invitation. I also can't say thank you enough for your ongoing mentorship and support over the years. I oftentimes tell folks I came here uh, as a former fifth grade teacher, not sure about what I was doing, why I was doing it, or if I was doing the right thing. But with the support of a lot of folks here, uh, I would have never envisioned this uh, uh, happening. So I got to take just a second for my attitude of gratitude. I see some of my old dear colleagues, Cynthia and Karen. I mean, we were all doctoral students here again still trying to figure this thing called academia out. Uh, it's always good to see you here. I see Walter Parker, who was another big support. I cannot say thank you enough. And then I see my academic mother in the back, Geneva Gay, right? I would not be here were it not for Geneva. If I don't say it enough, thank you, thank you for all you do. Uh, I give a lot of talks and I really get nervous. The only person who makes me a little bit uneasy is Geneva because as she says, if you don't get it right, I will tell you about it. So. I am on my A game today as best as I can because Geneva is in the room. So again, uh, it's all love. I can't say thank you enough. Uh, I see Joel Williams from Lott who's become a, a dear colleague, Joe Lott who's become a colleague. And I also see some of the folks from Ed CNI 505, right? Kati Winston, we had a great time with last summer. Uh, so it's good to see all these folks here from the University of Washington. I have to say this before I get into my talk. Um, so much of who I am as a scholar is because of the support and the mentorship and the guidance I receive from a lot of folks at this institution. And I cannot say thank you enough. I see my colleague, Chris, who was also part of that process. Cherry McGee Banks has been a, a supporter over the years. It helps to have a village of people who are concerned and care about your academic development. So for the students who are here, understand that you are in a really, really important and special place. Uh, you don't realize how much a place is supported until you leave it and then you realize what you had. So I'm asking you folks to understand what you have here because it's something unique that you don't see in many other places across the country. So uh, to that end, I have to say thank you for all the folks uh, who have made my trek possible here. And let me get into my talk because Jim said I have 40 minutes. You know what that means. That's 40 minutes because I'll be getting kicked off the stage if I'm not finishing that time frame. So I want to spend some time today talking to you uh, about my book and my work on black males. And one of the things that oftentimes happens is when I write on this topic or when I have spoken about this topic, folks always ask me the question, why black males? Uh, and I typically respond with a couple of different responses. Um, well, number one, I'm a black male, right? And so I think about some of the challenges and frustrations that I've seen along my journey. But it's also gotten more personal for me as a father of four, uh, and of those four children, three of them are, are sons. And so I've watched and seen and witnessed some of the challenges that they have had to endure uh, through schools. And this is with two parents who are highly educated. And so it oftentimes gives me pause why these young boys go through what they go through with parents who are advocates. What does it mean for those young boys who don't have the same kind of advocates for them? Um, so that's another reason. Uh, I also uh, do this work because uh, I spend a lot of time in schools, uh, visiting schools, talking to teachers, and I'm always intrigued by what happens when I walk into the office. And it oftentimes seems that who I frequently see sitting in the principal's office or waiting to see the principals are typically young boys, black boys. And I've oftentimes wondered why so many black boys are always in the office. Uh, even in schools where black children are not in big numbers, black boys are always in the office. And then this is coupled with the fact that when I talk to schools or I'm asked to come out and do PD with schools, I'm oftentimes ask, can you help us with our black boys? We need help with our black boys. So this has been an ongoing thing, that something seems to be occurring with black boys. And so my, 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 my desire to want to look at this is tied to those factors. But I also want to be clear before I get into the work on black boys that, that, that I by no means want to neglect or ignore other populations who also face challenges in our schools. And to that end, I have to talk about some works that are tied to black girls, because much of what I am seeing in schools uh, also afflicts black girls. And I want to make sure that you understand that there are a number of works that are growing that are putting the spotlight on black girls. Uh, my colleague and friend Venus Evans-Winter has, has, has looked at black girls 
uh, with her work on teaching black girls, which I think is important work to be mindful of. Uh, also, Barbara Smith has done work on black girls. Uh, and there's a new book by Pat Lark that will be coming out later on this year where she also examines the challenges that black girls face. So please understand that I'm aware of those realities as well. The other question I frequently get is what about other boys of color? Uh, don't they face similar challenges? And to that I would agree, yes they do. Uh, and again, I'm mindful of the work by folks such as Gil Conscious who has looked at the experiences of Latino males. Uh, as well as uh, uh, looking at the, the, the challenges of other males of color that, that Conscious has looked at. And my friend and colleague Pedro Naguera has also looked at this work with regard to uh, Latino males, black males, and other Southeast Asian males as well. So I want to be mindful that I'm aware of the realities affecting other populations. And by no means, by my focusing on black males, does that somehow suggest that other populations are not experiencing difficulties. But I do want to be very intentional, and I try to be very intentional, that there's a reason why a spotlight needs to be placed on black males. Because when you look at a litany of data, uh, it paints a very troubling and disturbing picture, and there's no two ways around it. And I think it's okay for us to be very unapologetic in a focus on a population that seems to be quite on the margins, not just in schools, but also in the wider society. And so part of what I would also say is when we say why focus on black boys, because there's a gross disparity in particular types of outcomes that we have to pay attention to. And we see these disparities taking place in issues such as employment, um, overall lifetime earnings, uh, school graduation, college completion, college enrollment. And there's this vicious cycle that continues to affect this group in ways that I think that needs to be paid attention to. And then there's also this way in which we see this disadvantage being played out that has an gener intergenerational effect where it seems to be impacting young boys in ways that it's not affecting young girls. And I want to talk about that for a second if I can. Uh, I have a group of doctoral students who have worked with me on this topic for the last six or seven years through the Black Male Institute. And one of the things we looked at, for example, is family structures. And so there's data that has come out that's not new, but it's looked at children born in single family households. And of course, uh, this is not new data, it's been this way for some time, but it looked at the fact that black children, more so than any other group of students, are likely to be raised in single parent households. So what's the takeaway from that? Uh, that alone does not suggest anything because I believe it's not about family uh, composition that matters in terms of outcomes, more disposition that matters. But what's intriguing to note, if you look at black children who grow up in single parent households, there are some things that happen with black boys that don't happen with black girls. Uh, case in point would be the following. So when you look at some of the research by Jacob and Kyle Clark, they've looked at the fact that when looking at black boys and black girls growing up in single parent households, it reduces college attendance for boys but not for girls. Girls go to college at the same rates whether it's a two parent household or a one parent household. And we've seen an increase in the number of black girls going to college over the last couple of years. I want to be clear about the fact that it still lags behind their Asian, white, uh, and, and uh, uh, Latina counterparts, but it's still higher than black boys. And also what this research has found is that father absence in black homes increases juvenile delinquency amongst boys, but again, not among girls. I think that's a salient finding. It's telling us something that happens differently for young boys in these circumstances compared to girls. Uh, and also there is research that tells us that there is a significant amount of behavior increases uh, for boys than girls under the same household. So in many ways, uh, some might suggest there's this saying that happens in many black families that when you have single parent households that are oftentimes led by black women that in some cases black women uh, raise their daughters and love their sons. Uh, so there's something different that's going on where we're asking the question about what is happening with black boys in these circumstances. Moreover, you look at some additional data. When you look at father education and how much it has an impact uh, for young boys. And a father who graduates from high school uh, reduces juvenile delinquency for boys but not for girls. Again, the data seems to tell us that girls are getting something different out of the situation than boys are. Uh, and again, when you have boys uh, are less likely to complete college than their sisters if the father's absent or less educated. So fathers with a high school diploma have a significant impact on the educational outcomes of their sons. Uh, if fathers don't have that educational attainment, again, girls don't seem to affect, but be affected in the same way. And then what we see is that issues around incarceration, uh, aberrant behavior are much more likely to take place uh, when we have fathers not there. So in short, what we know is that, that having men in these circumstances where young boys are being raised matters. And so part of what I wanted to look at is how do we begin to understand the set of circumstances that young boys face. 
And then I think this conversation would be remiss to talk about issues affecting black boys if we did not look at the larger social landscape. Uh, and that larger social landscape is the following, and I'm often time intrigued by this, and I maintain that we have this love-hate affair with black boys, right? Uh, this, this idea that we love them if they are athletic, uh, we love them if they are docile, passive, and, and more or less follow the script that we expect them to follow. Uh, but the minute they begin to raise questions, the minute they begin to, to, to uh, express opinions that are not in the, in the popular domain, then all of a sudden they become problematic. Uh, much of popular culture is based on the, the styles and the attributes of black boys. So how can we embrace a group on the one hand, yet be so somewhat disturbed by their behaviors and actions on the other? So we've got to come to grips with this love-hate affair when our young men become expressive and challenge the status quo and make their opinions known about things that are happening in school. So, uh, and part of what I got from this work was talking to young boys who say that as long as they can run a football up on the field or, or shoot a basketball without complaining, they get embraced by teachers and administrators in the entire nine yards. But the minute they begin to raise questions about how come they can't get access to AP courses or why they're not being, being uh, given scholarship opportunities, they're seen or perceived as a threat. So I think that larger context has to be a part of the conversation as well. And then even more recently, uh, why this topic I think is timely is because what we see happening across the country uh, when we look at the, 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 the growing number of, of shootings and deaths of young black men and boys, for us not to engage in this conversation I think would be irresponsible. Uh, far too many young boys uh, are losing their lives uh, at the hands of law enforcement. And I've heard the argument about the fact that what about the fact that black kids kill black kids? That's a different conversation altogether. Uh, and I don't think we should conflate the two. The reality is when you have young 12-year-old boys such as Tamir Rice being gunned down by police officers, that should give us all pause. That should give us all concern and ask what is happening. Uh, why is it that so many young black boys and men are being seen in so many spaces as public enemy number one? So I think it's within the spirit of recognizing and remembering these young boys and men that we have to get this work right. Uh, the Michael Browns, the Jordan Davises, uh, the Oscar Grants, uh, uh, the Freddie Grays, uh, the Trayvon Martins, those lives matter. Those lives are important and I think it's part of a larger narrative that we have to fight that tells us that these young men are deemed as a threat. These young boys are seen as a problem. Uh, and I oftentimes think about W.E.B. Du Bois' work, and I talk about this in the book, uh, where in The Soul of a Black Folk, he talks about what does it mean to be a problem. And part of what we see is that for far too many black boys, they are deemed in their classrooms as a problem. Uh, they're viewed in their schools as a problem. And part of what we have to do is begin to reshift that narrative where they are not seen as a problem, but they're seen as an asset to the overall learning community. Now, uh, part of what my concern is, is that part of this, this, this uh, what I call a demonization, is happening to black boys early and often. Uh, and we have to put focus on it in terms of how and where it happens. Uh, the US Department of Education put out a report last year that looked at suspension across K-12 context. And now we have data on suspension of preschoolers. I'm gonna say those two words again together. <laughs> suspension among preschoolers, okay? If that still didn't kind of have an impact on you, I'll say it one more time. Suspension and preschoolers. I don't know how those two words fit in the same sentence. Yeah. Uh, again, I don't know what you do as a three or four year old that warrants you being suspended but apparently it is happening, and as you can imagine, it's got a clear set of racial ramifications associated with it. So if you look at the data put out by the U.S. Department of Education, black children, I call them black babies. When you're three or four years old, you're babies. Let's call it what it is, right? Uh, represent about 18% of all preschool children, but are 42% of students suspended at least once. And 48% of students suspended more than once. Again, I don't know what you do as a three or four year old to, to warrant or merit suspension, but it's happening and it's happening to black children and more specifically black boys more often than not. And so part of what you have to understand is that this labeling of black children and black boys happens early on, three, four, five years old, and oftentimes the label does not get removed because these children are now deemed as problem children. Uh, you have children who are missing valuable instruction time. 
Uh, Daniel Lawson uh, just put out a book last year that I thought was a phenomenal breakdown of the number of instructional hours lost by children who were suspended and expelled. And his contention is that black boys are the primary targets in this process, and it starts as early as preschool, continues through kindergarten, and stays the course throughout the K-12 experience for far too many black children. So we have to ask, what is it that is happening with school discipline that, 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 that necessitates these group of students being dealt with in one way, but yet their counterparts from other backgrounds are not dealt with in the same fashion. And part of the work that we did with young black boys, we, we heard time and time again how I do one thing, my white peer does the same thing, I get dealt with in a much more harsh fashion. That's the question we have to ask. What are we doing with teachers where they see black boys as being somehow much more of a threat, much more problematic, despite the fact that black boys maintain that they're their white male counterparts engage in far more egregious behaviors, but oftentimes are met with a slap on the wrist, if any consequence at all. So we've got to understand how this happens early and it continues to have a, a damaging effect over time. Now, where I'm concerned of how it plays itself out are in a couple of areas. I'm a former classroom teacher. Um, we can look at a couple of areas that begins to tell us almost how students will fare over the long haul. If you look at this chart here, I'd ask you to look at the far right on the reading proficiency score. This is data that came out just last year. U.S. Department of Education uh, looks at reading and math proficiency at fourth grade and eighth grade. And in my mind, these figures right here should cause pause for all of us. Uh, because what it tells us is that when you look at black children, the fact that we only have 14 percent are reading at proficient levels in the fourth grade and 12 percent reading at proficiency in the eighth grade is a huge, huge problem. It tells us that something is not happening that should be occurring. And when you look at the numbers for black boys, they're in the single digits. And I oftentimes focus on literacy because I maintain that it's the single most important predictor from an academic standpoint of how well children will do in schools. No disrespect to my math folks, no disrespect to my social studies folks, no disrespect to my science folks. But reading is so fundamental to the overall academic development of students uh, from the time they start school. And so when you look at the fact that you take children out of school through suspensions and expulsions, that becomes at least one of the reasons why we see these numbers uh, reflecting quite dismal rates. And my concern becomes when we're talking about any group of students, any group of students, we have over 80 percent of these students are not reading at grade level by grade four, the likelihood that they'll ever catch up is not very high. And for some students, this has become just normal business as usual. We expect these students to not perform well, and there's no outcry, there's no outrage, there's no uproar. So these data I continue to share with folks across the country say that we have to look specifically at data at certain schools to see where do we see certain students who are in most need. And rest assured, as I talk to school districts across the country, as they disaggregate data, the number one group almost among every school district I work with is black boys. Uh, in terms of not meeting the mark. And so then you can almost begin to predict what that means when you talk about kids who are now being labeled as being problematic. I think you look at Michelle Alexander's book on the new Jim Crow. She talks about the criminalization uh, of children of color. But I think when you really start to drill down, you look at the fact that in 2013, black males comprised approximately 7% of the total number of children in U.S. schools, about 4 million students across the board of black boys. Um, and so when you look at the ways in which we label kids as being problem, uh, they become viewed as, 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 as children who are disrupting the learning situation. And then you start to look at how we put them on this fast track to what many folks have talked about with the school to prison pipeline. It explains the fact that when you look at 7% of the population under the age of 18, but yet 40% of school aged children who are arrested are black boys. Again, this is why I say we have to be unapologetic and intentional when you've got that kind of gross disproportionality of any group of students where they're that small of, a, of, a, of the population, but that large of a group of students were being arrested. Uh, there are also 43% of all cases that end up in juvenile court. 45% of youth in juvenile detention are black boys. And 60% of the cases waived to the criminal courts in this country are all black boys. Uh, we had a project that we've been doing for the past couple of years in Los Angeles called Freedom Schools. And Freedom Schools are now operating in detention centers across Los Angeles County. It is one of the most sobering things to walk into a youth detention center and to see young children as young as eight, nine years old already in incarcerated circumstances, right? Uh, and when you look at these children, babies, as I said earlier, it almost, it, it not almost, it breaks your heart to think how do we allow that to happen in a so-called civilized society? Uh, young babies uh, who, who are already 
on a, on, a, on, a, on a trajectory that suggests that their life outcomes are not going to be very positive. So that's why we have to say the spotlight needs to be on particular groups because there's no other group of individuals in this country where we see this kind of disproportionality where it comes to issues of incarceration and criminalization. So uh, part of what we do with our students at UCLA, we talk about sort of the way in which blackness has been viewed as being problematic, being viewed as criminal, being viewed as being pathological. Uh, we read the book by Khalil Muhammad where he talks about the condemnation of blackness, where he talks about the fact that the current set of circumstances around black children is not new, uh, that unless we are willing to have conversations about race and racism, we'll, we'll, we'll never get to the understanding of these issues. Uh, I know there are a growing course of folks who talk about we're in this post-racial period. I always question how can you be post-racial when you haven't been racial yet, right? Uh, we have still not engaged in an honest, sustained, uh, conversation about race and racism. It still happens in schools. Uh, it still causes me much um, chagrin to walk into classrooms across this country and to have teachers who tell me all the time that they don't see color, they see children. Uh, knowing all too well we see race every single day. There's been a litany of research that has documented the, 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 the destructiveness of colorblind approaches. So part of what we read in, in Muhammad's work is this ideological currency of black criminality he talks about. I would argue that these remnants are in place in classrooms, in schools. And I want to be clear about this, because when we talk to students, young black boys, about the ways in which they got deemed as being a problem, and I'll talk about this with some of their quotes in a minute, um, it's important to note that this, this ideological currency of black criminality, if you juxtapose that within the context of schools, I think we, 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 um, we look at this as this, this sort of ideology that white teachers have towards black boys. Uh, and part of what we find from our data is that this is a mindset that permeates across all ethnic and racial groups. And our, the, the, the young men that we talked to made it very evident and made it very clear that there were black teachers who were equally as culpable of doing these things. Asian teachers who were equally as culpable of doing these things. Latino teachers who were equally as culpable as engaging in these events. So this is not, and I tell teachers this all the time, this is not something that, that white teachers do to black children. This is something that, that teachers across the board, regardless of their race or ethnicity or, or gender, are engaging in this ideology that says that black children, black boys, are, are deemed as problematic. And so then this idea of linking crime and aberrant behavior to race has been sort of at the core of what we've seen in this country for a very long time. Uh, with black boys and black men oftentimes being some of the, the largest culprits of how that has played out. So part of what we do, it's important, especially from a, from a pre-service teacher standpoint, and I'll talk about this a bit more on the back end, to begin to help our pre-service teachers to understand the ideological roots of some of this stuff, because if they don't get that at the core, they can very well engage in behaviors that only perpetuate the problem over time. So you look at all these factors, and it begins to explain this, this push out dropout issue that, that, that lots of folks have talked about. Uh, you see that the, the highest numbers of students who, who are disengaged from schools, American Indian children, which there's a larger conversation we need to have around Native American children that I think we are oftentimes dismissive of. Uh, but again, you look at Latino and, and black children are oftentimes uh, the groups of students who are, who are most likely to disengage from schools yet we've see, we, we view them as the problem and we don't look at the larger structures that have created that have been created that pushed them out in the first place. So this is all tied to a larger landscape of why folks say why focus on certain subgroups because we are clear about the fact that certain students don't experience schools in the same way as others. And for us to act as if this is a one size fits all I think is, is highly problematic and, and really I think intellectually irresponsible. So now, so what do we do? And part of what, what I try to do in the book is engage in what my colleague Danny Solorsono talks about is a counter narrative for black males. Uh, this counter narrative that really talks about how do you begin to allow a population to, create, to craft or create their own narrative. Uh, black boys have been studied for a long time. Um, black people have been studied for a long time. Uh, the challenge with that has been it's oftentimes been them being studied by the other. Uh, and that studying by the other oftentimes has created pathological accounts of who uh, folks are. And so part of what Solorsano and Yoso and others have talked about is what would it look like if the people who are often most overlooked, most marginalized, uh, most excluded from opportunities within the educational realm were able to tell their own stories, were able to offer their own narratives, 
were, ever, were able to suggest their own solutions for what works in schools, right? What a novel idea. So in short, we spent over, oh my goodness, I can't tell you how many hours talking to young men, urban schools, rural schools, public schools, private schools, uh, um, small schools, charter schools, talking to young black boys. And I want to say this, that this project in many ways was um, enlightening because black boys are not monolithic. Uh, we talked to black boys who were uh, in, in, on the West Coast, black boys in the Midwest, uh, those who had come from highly educated homes, uh, those who came from low-income homes, uh, young black boys who were biracial, uh, some who were Muslim, uh, uh, some who identified as being gay. Uh, the idea was to talk about the, 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 the multiplicity of black male identity. Uh, because part of what some want to do is say, this is how black males think. This is how black males act. And believe you me, we saw the full gamut of how black males uh, manifest their identity. And part of why we did this was to begin to allow them to talk about how they experience schools. And I have to say this, uh, a lot of them were really shocked that people wanted to talk to them about them. Uh, I remember being at one school, and as we talked to a couple young men about our project and what we were doing, and the young man looked at us, he said, you want to talk to us about being black and male? I'm like, yeah. He said, okay, what's the catch? I'm like, no, there's no catch. He said, you need some more people because I can go get a whole bunch of us. We can really talk to you, right? This idea being that nobody really listens to us, nobody wants to hear us, nobody values our perspectives and our opinions. So I want to just give you just a small snapshot into some of the kinds of things that these young men talked about because I think they're important. And there's a lot of areas I wish I could cover now, but I'm not. But I want to just talk about these three areas uh, these young men focused on this awareness of racial stereotypes that they oftentimes contend with, uh, the way they talked about racial and structural disadvantage uh, circumstances. Uh, and then this third one we found interesting is just wanting to be humanized. And, and I found that to be really, really um, poignant because they really talked about the ways in which they felt like they were oftentimes looked at as, as being something that other students were not. So when it comes to the awareness of racial stereotypes, this came up over and over and over again. Uh, we found that young boys as early as eight, nine, and 10 years old were aware of the fact that they were viewed as being something different because they were black boys. Uh, and they oftentimes had to be mindful of how they engaged in their own day-to-day -day behaviors because they know they were being looked at through that prism. Um, so some of the, the quotes that the young men shared with us, uh, teachers see us and just assume we are up to no good, right? starting something or not taking us seriously. They make these little comments too, which hurts after a while. So these kind of comments fall in line with a lot of folks that have been talking about racially along the lines of these racial microaggressions. Chester Pierce and uh, Daniel Solorzano have talked about these subtle, stunning put downs that students hear over time. Uh, there were so many of these comments that the young men offered us throughout the course of this data that we collected uh, that they have to question, did I just hear what I think I heard? Did she just say what I thought she said? Or did he just do what I thought he did, right? These things that happen, these comments that you think, okay, was that directed toward me where you can't quite wrap your head around it, but you know it had an impact. And the cumulative effect of always hearing these things makes you question your own intellect, makes you question your own pursuit of educational opportunity in ways that oftentimes they believe other students don't have to contend with. Um, some students, they always have to think, what are they thinking about me, right? How many students have to sort of carry that burden with them on an ongoing basis? Uh, if they think I'm going to gangbang, rap, or act stupid, then I just work on doing the opposite. So when they see me on the honor roll, they seem surprised, and I just tripped off that. So a lot of these young people talked about how do they debunk the stereotype? How do they disrupt uh, the, the sort of the deficit view of who they are? Because if they did that, they would somehow hopefully try to change the black male stereotype. However, there were others who talked about the fact that despite everything that I might do right, there's still gonna be those out there who still see me in these negative terms. And that has to be, to me, that was disheartening because these young men felt like they were put in a box and they couldn't get out the box because of what society has said about them in so many ways. So this idea of stereotyping was big. Uh, and you know, we heard these cases time and time again of how they were oftentimes deemed as the problem, right? We got into this fight, one young man says, I said he started referring to his, his, uh, his I think his white uh, uh, classmate. He said, I started, but the principal believed him. I'd never been in trouble at school before, and this kid got into trouble a lot, but I'm the one who got kicked out, and he stayed at the school, right? These stories were told time and time and time again. I maintain, and the students you know, affirm this for us, that 
especially young kids. It's, when we talk to some of our elementary school students, they are, they are maybe, they are, I, I maintain kids are aware of race at young ages, but I think that they are more in tune with fairness, right? So I was talking, he was talking, you gave him a verbal warning, you put my name on the board, right? Uh, we were both out of our seats, you told me to go stand in the corner and you told him to sit down, right? Those kind of instances came up from our young children time and time again, issues of fairness. How come he got to come up two times to talk to you, but the first time I tried to get up, you told me sit back down, right? Those accounts were, were peppered throughout our data set as they talked about the ways in which they just wondered, are you doing this to me because I'm black and he's not black, right? And students oftentimes said, you can't confirm it, but the suspicion is always in the back of your mind of it making you wonder if you're getting treated differently because you're black and male. Then there was these issues around racism and structural disadvantage, uh, where some students said they didn't think it was race as much as they thought it was class. Um, they talked about the conditions in which they were expected to learn. They said, if you look at this school, uh, you go through metal detectors just to get in. Half the teachers don't care. Uh, you walk into their classes, you can tell. We have substitute teachers the whole year. Uh, how can you have a school and you don't even have teachers to teach the kids? Uh, I think that we are black and poor have a lot to do with it. So some kids really couldn't separate out where race was, was the factor as opposed to poverty um, uh, or, or, or social class. And I think that was important because throughout this data, again, the students talked about the fact that you would never allow schools that look like this to be in certain kind of communities where other kids are, might, are quite prevalent. I have to say that where we saw a lot of the, the discrepancies taking place were in middle class schools where black kids were in the minority uh, because there it almost seemed as if the kids felt like they were constantly having to make the case of why they belonged uh, because they were among the minority. They wanted the few black kids. A question get raised about why they're there, if they're in the right class. The students talked about the fact that when they show up in an AP class, the teacher automatically assumed that they must have been in the wrong class because you couldn't be in an AP class. Those kinds of comments came up time and time again. Uh, and so again, this ties to the work that, again, I, I, I want to I share some of the ways in which we are trying to engage our pre-service teachers around understanding this. And one of our favorite works is The Racial Contract by Charles Mills. Uh, and in it, Mills talks about, again, about racism as this social contract embedded in an ideology based on white supremacy that permeates structures, rules, and laws. Uh, and this discourse is undergirded by statistical advances in modern social scientists. So again, Mills' work is important here because he helps us to understand race and racism, uh, again, from, a, from an ideological standpoint. It's a deep philosophical read, but our students find it to be very helpful to, to sort of ground the, the larger uh, sort of discourse around race in the country. And then this last point around humanization. Uh, and this is what really kind of got to, to me, at least, as these young men said, they just wanted to be treat like, treated like normal kids. Um, you know, one young man said, we want to tell people to treat us like normal human beings. We hurt, we cry, we laugh, we make mistakes like anybody else. Uh, we just want to be human. And so that was really big because to me what that suggests is that oftentimes these young men feel like they're oftentimes dehumanized in schools. How can we just play? How can we laugh? How can we talk like any other group of students without being deemed again as being a problem? You know, I have to tell the story. I always think about my, um, my own sons when it comes to this because I, like many other parents of black boys, have had these conversations about how they have to behave in certain spaces. And my youngest son uh, is 17. But I remember about three, no, about five, six years ago, he kind of sprouted up like, like, a, like a weed. He kind of grew out of nowhere. He was about 11 years old, almost big as I was. And I remember him, you know, in one of his rare cases, he's kind of an introvert, but one of these cases, he was outside playing with some of his peers. And so he's running up and down the street chasing some kids. They were chasing him. And I remember having that talk to him and say, you know what, Jelani, you got you to gotta, you gotta think twice about that because you can't, you can't just run up and down the street chasing after your friends like that because that doesn't look the same way to everybody. And I, I remember him looking at me perplexed, like, you know, what are you talking about, Dad? But part of my thinking and thinking of lots of other parents who have these conversations is that despite the fact that you are 11 years old, the wider society will see you as a grown man. So part of what is concerning is that these young men talked about almost like their childhood was taken away from them, things that they cannot do that other children can do, ways that they cannot play like other children can play ways they cannot have fun like their peers can because they are viewed or deemed as being 
somebody who is a threat or someone who is a, 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 a troublemaker. So that's what this idea of humanization reminds me of. How can we just be regular 11-year-old children, right? How can we just experience our childhood like anyone else does? And that came through time and time again. Uh, and then I think about young, one young man who was at a high school that we worked at in Los Angeles, and he was like, I mean, I'm a big dude. I'm like 6'3 and 250 pounds. I always have to think twice about what I say and how I say it. Because people look at me and they're scared of me, right? Uh, I don't want to be seen as the big angry black dude, but treat me like you would treat any other person and we'll be just fine. So again, having to think about the space that you occupy, the place you occupy, the ways in which people are going to see you. Thank you very much. I'm sweating like a pig up here, right? Um, <laughs> And so this idea of just being seen as being normal people, right? Uh, and, and part of what these young men talked about is the conversations that they'd had with parents. If you're out on the streets and the police stop you, it's yes, sir, it's no, sir, it's don't talk back, it's don't give any lip, because that could mean your life being taken. That could mean that you would end up in jail. It's those kinds of conversations that these young men talked about time and time again. That, make, that helps us to understand how they experience schools and society in a very different fashion. So this idea of humanization was a big one too. Another area I won't talk about here, but I talk about in the book is the idea of sports. We're in it, and this is where I got a lot of criticism from folks. Uh, I kind of question the salience of sports because oftentimes black males are seen right away as being the, 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 the athlete. And I, I think that in some circles, and I, I, again, I get a lot of criticism for this, that we're almost putting too much emphasis on sports with black boys and not enough on the academic side. And I think we have to have a conversation about what that means if we put a fraction of that effort and time and energy into academics and the way we do with sports, that it might produce some different kind of outcomes. But I swear I gave that talk in a, in a, in a place in Los Angeles, they wanted to throw eggs at me. I was like, look, I'm not saying get rid of sports. I'm just saying I think we have far too many young, of our young men see sports as a way out. And, and, and I think that uh, it pains me to say it. I think sometimes we're a part of that, parents and family members. That's a whole conversation for another day. So what's working? Uh, in the book, I talk about these different programs that are moving the needle with black boys, right? And so one of the things I'd recommend folks to take a look at uh, is the CBMA, the Campaign for Black Male Achievement. There are some phenomenal programs happening across the country that are moving the needle with black males. So in Oakland Unified, my colleague and friend Chris Chapman had, had the first Office of African American Male Achievement, where they focus specifically on black boys. Uh, I visited with uh, Ron Walker and the, and the Coalition of Schools for Boys of Color, and they have a network of schools that they work with that are focusing specifically on black boys and other boys of color. In Detroit, they have the Parent Project, where they're improving the outcomes for black boys by helping to rethink how parents engage with their sons. Uh, Jason Wilson has the Union Project, where they're working in after-school programs to help the academic support. So the idea being that there are a lot of things that are out there working. And I think we have to put a spotlight on those things because that way we can begin to inform more schools. What is happening in these schools? I'll touch on them real quick. One of the things we see, there's a focus on trauma. We are seeing far too many of our young boys are experiencing trauma. And if we don't address trauma, we don't help them academically, socially, or emotionally. Uh, and so when you look at the ways in which some of these programs are focusing on emotional, psychological well-being, uh, we talk about trauma, complex trauma, uh, compounded trauma. Uh, so I believe, and I've been saying this for a while, that every school, every school should have a school psychologist on its location, should have a social worker there because you have young people who are seeing and witnessing things that young children should not have to be subjected to. So the schools that we see moving the needle focus on trauma. What else do we see? Uh, this focus on working with pre-service teachers. I, again, I told you I'm a teacher at heart. This is what I do. This is what got me into this work. I think this is one of the main front lines. And so we have to think about teacher education from two angles, not just on the pre-service side, where a lot of our focus is on, but with the pre-service side, we have to think about how we put teachers, pre-service teachers that is, in classrooms, in schools, uh, where they see examples of young boys of color having success. They have to see it. If you don't fundamentally believe that these young men can be successful from the outset of your career, the likelihood that you'll ever help to recognize it as a reality becomes more of a challenge. Uh, and then we also have to talk about, you know, reflecting on teacher education, about what we do in terms of who's preparing teachers. Uh, I maintain that we talk about diversifying the teacher education population, but I've always maintained that we need to diversify the teacher educators, the folks who are doing the work. We can't expect the students to be diverse if the folks who are doing the preparation don't look much more diverse than they are. 
Uh, and so this is what we have to think about on the pre-service side. On the in-service side, that's where probably most of the work still needs to occur. Uh, more districts are looking at implicit bias of classroom practice, where we see children of color are much more likely to be affected by it. Uh, teacher mentoring is essential. Uh, I cannot tell you how many times you walk into a school, you see teacher in room A is doing phenomenal work, yet teacher right next door to her is struggling mightily, and those two folks never have a conversation together, right? We have to structure mentoring opportunities so that teachers who are struggling can see, learn, and benefit from what teachers who are doing this well, what that looks like. And that ties into ongoing professional development, as well as the identification of best practices, which uh, I maintain is happening. We talked to the young men. They told us time and time again about certain teachers who were really good at what they did, how they did it, why they did it. And I think we need to continue to spotlight those kinds of practices. Um, next thing we see in these programs, as before I close, is this focus on resilience, right? Um, in the programs that are working, part of what the focus has been on is looking at home, peers, community, and school supports. Uh, focusing on that middle column, the youth needs. Pro these programs that move the needle, be it in school or out of school, say that oftentimes when they create these spaces where students have basically issues around safety, uh, love, belonging, care, they felt much more engaged. This is all relational, right? Students do better when they feel like somebody who's in front of them deeply cares about them, plain and simple, right? I don't care if you're blue, green, red, or yellow. If I know that when you stand up in front of a classroom, you have my best interest at heart, there's no limit to how far I will go. And teachers told us that time and time and time again. Uh, the students said that they could tell within a matter of moments a teacher who had their best interest at heart. So we stress that this idea of youth needs being critical to their overall resilience, that subsequently increased self-efficacy, increased their goals and aspirations, and then it's starting to move the needle on improved academic outcomes. And some of the improved academic outcomes I have to stress is that the, the programs that are working, we're not looking solely at traditional measures. So we're not looking at just at GPA or grades. Sometimes it's a thing about whether or not a, a child even shows up at a classroom. Uh, because we will see some students who will be at the school who will never step foot in a certain classroom, but would never miss another classroom. So what is it that's happening in one classroom compared to the next that tells us something is happening that they find beneficial? And then, I, again, I come back to literacy because it matters. Uh, there's a wonderful book that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, Alfred Tatum, who puts his focus specifically on black male adolescents and reading where he talks about the ways in which we see many young boys disengaged from school because they read stories that don't look like them, that don't reflect their experiences, that don't tie into their realities. So he's got this big, big sort of um, repository of sorts on different works that they've used with young black boys that have increased their engagement, increased their effort. And I'm going to also refer everybody to look at the work that's being done by the Children's Defense Fund's Freedom Schools. I think Freedom Schools is one of the, the more innovative, uh, and the more, I think, culturally responsive model that is moving the needle that has not been seen on the national level. Freedom Schools have been around for almost, what, 30 years now? No, about 25 years. Uh, and they're still not getting the attention or the spotlight that I think that they need because they put a focus on literacy, but also a focus on civic engagement. Uh, and they are working with children who are behind academically, but beginning to get those students to move the needle in some really, really powerful ways. And so some other resources I would also refer folks to. Uh, Sean Harper, his new book on black male student success from preschool through PhD, I think is a must read because he talks about this from not just a K-12 perspective, but what it also looks like for students uh, throughout the graduate school level. Because we wonder why we don't see more black males on college campuses. There's an obvious pipeline issue that has to be looked at as well. Uh, and Adriel Hilton has written about black males in post-secondary education. And that work is also critical because it speaks to some of these same issues about how and why this population struggles. Um, so the goal here is plain and simple. How do we challenge and change the narrative on black males? Uh, I've had a chance to visit a number of different programs across the country. Uh, the Eagle Academy program is a phenomenal one in, in, in New York. Uh, Urban Prep in Chicago uh, has done some, some important work. And the goal is plain and simple, is that first and foremost, I'll say this time and time again, not all black males are out committing crimes. Most are not. Uh, most are not causing trouble in communities around us. Most are, are, are regular law-abiding children doing what they're asked to do, yet and still this narrative seems to affect far too many of them. And so part of what I would ask you to help us to think about is how we change the narrative, 
how we help to recreate and reimagine a new way in which we think about how black males experience schools and society. And I maintain at the end of the day, when you help those who are at the bottom of the academic continuum, everybody benefits, right? I think much of what we're talking about for black males is not specific for black males, but also can benefit other males of color uh, and other marginalized populations. So the idea is how do we change the narrative for black males so that we can change the narrative for schools across the board.